So here we go. Welcome, Don. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Chris. Given the uh, state of calamity of the world, I am yeah. uh, locked in my office in my home studio, making magic and art. And uh, you know, the the gardens are in bloom. We've got century old fruit trees in our yard, and right now it's just a sense of peace oh. to sit under an apricot tree, almost like it's snowing petals on you. Um, <sighs> I, I am truly, uh, I, I don't want to take it for granted. I mean, sometimes I just kind of mutter and say, oh, this is a mess I have to clean up. But this year is different. I look at that tree and I think, wow, this is this is a privilege uh, to just kind of sit here in my own backyard and, and be at peace. We are, we, we've done some gardening today, um, p putting putting the, the tomatoes, the tiny tomatoes in bigger pots and Ah, so, and, and you seem to have gotten a haircut since I was on your show <laughs> yes. recently. Uh, my my wife me. cut my hair. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, it would have gotten worse. In fact, we were kind of making a running joke that I'll only get my hair cut when I get a vaccine and I can go out to the hairdressers. And, and that joke was fine for a while, but it kept dragging on and yeah. on. And then eventually <laughs> there, it came to a point, no, this is just not tenable anymore. It's, it's got to go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm still holding out. I'm still trying to be to become the, the like the artist type who can swoosh their hair back. Oh, I, I was looking like the old man in the woods, you know, a man mm -hmm. who looks like he's 80 years old, but really he's 35 or something, and uh, and just grizzled, and so I, I had to make a change. <laughs> uh, that's well, yeah, that's fine. Um, let's talk about a few things. The reason I got you on here, well, first of all, your book is due. Right? Yes, Pretty yes, soon? actually. I, I have I have with me here a content proof. Um, that's the, the entire book from the, the press, and it is actually going on press as we speak. But what's um, the official title? Macro photography, a subtitle? Macro photography, the universe at our feet. Oh. And uh, so the content proof came to me just to, you know, double check all of the layouts and font sizes and making sure that things are legible, et cetera, along with some additional, um, uh, you know, color calibrated uh, image proofs and so on. Uh, and I reviewed all that, made all the changes that they needed. And uh, I'm expecting uh, this coming week as we record to receive images from the press. I requested that whoever's operating the press take some photos of, mm -hmm. uh, of the book in the printing process and the binding process. Um, and that uh, it, it had been slightly delayed on their end. It should have been done by now, but uh, everything's being delayed these days. Uh, I'm expecting delivery in the first week of May. Amazing. And I cannot tell you how happy I am. <laughs> Uh, this, isn't this isn't okay? So so I, I've I've gone through the process of writing books, same as you, with the main difference that I've worked with a publisher. So for me, it was not, I didn't have to do any layouting. I didn't have to do any print uh, surveillance. I didn't have to do any of that. But of course, the writing process, the the putting a book together, I mean that that in itself for, to me is kind of a daunting thing because. You start, and this is this huge mountain, and you try to find an outline, and to try to find a structure, and then you fill and it, it just, in. And it constantly changes. As you get halfway through, you and realize that the beginning yes. part has to change because the second <laughs> half is going to be different than what you thought it was going to be as you yes. get there, right? Yes, and then you and then you write, and then you change, and then you write, and then you change, and you you eat you eat away on it just a little bit at a, every day, and then at one point. Um, it kind of becomes and gets into a shape, but it is to me the I'm I'm just preparing to write another one, and it is really really uh, uh, an interesting process. And then once it's done, once it's finished, you have this, or I have this sense of relief. Oh yeah, the sense like, of even pride, though because I'm you know? also the publisher. I have to be doing the logistics of delivering the books too, and that uh, which I couldn't do. It's going to be. Uh, you know what? It's not that bad. I just have to print out shipping labels, put them in, uh, you know, padded envelopes of the right size. I decided that was the best and fastest way uh, to, to go through it right. rather than custom made boxes, because that took a lot more labor, uh, which I had done with my first book. And I just want to get as many out the door as possible, as quickly as possible. And if something arrives damaged, I can replace it. I can eat whatever that percentage is in terms right. of, uh, of that. But uh, and the shipping companies reimburse you for it. And, so. and you've done it before. Uh, so. I've, I've done it before, yeah. But uh, but this book was much more complicated 
uh, in terms of the content design and, uh, and and the flow of everything. As you mentioned, that, that's such a fluid thing as you go through. And you've seen it. You've, you've taken a look at it. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It, it, wow. <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just amazing. But then on the other hand, there's also this sense of, um, well, for me, this just 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 doing a deep dive on one area of photography just this one mm -hmm. area for you that is macro for me that was wide angle and looking at it from all those different a angles and and all the different facets of it i mean i'm so glad i did that because it is such an amazing learning experience because you learn well, it new things it pushes while you, do you it. right yes exactly it pushes you beyond what you thought was uh, an entirety of knowledge on the subject until right. you try to write a book on it. And then you realize, <laughs> you, oh, realize you, you what never you actually know. <laughs> went here or there or yes. this other place. You never, okay, wide angle is great, but did I ever explore wide angle tilt shift photography? No? Yeah. Well, that's an entire chapter of a book, yes. I'm sure. Uh, and you have and, a tilt shift chapter in there. Uh, no, I don't. No, but, don't. Uh, <laughs> but but I'm, I'm saying like, if you are doing a wide angle. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's that, that, true. That, I was that, looking that's at one of the macro things I missed tilt on. shift. Macro and tilt shift could be really interesting. Maybe but not the shift part, but the niche. tilt part might be really interesting there. Uh, shift could also be interesting in, in a roundabout way, not necessarily by shifting the lens, but uh, a feature that I've uh, found quite useful in, in a lot of modern cameras, uh, uh, Olympus, Panasonic, Sony, Fuji, maybe some others, I'm not sure, have a high resolution mode built into, uh, uh, into their camera bodies where they can shift the image yes. sensor around, which, you know, shifting with a tilt shift lens would allow you to create a, a pretty well perfect panorama from left to right or up or down, however it's uh, oriented. Um, but by taking eight to 16, I think Olympus has a five image mode as well, but um, uh, typically eight to 16, images uh, by letting the camera do its thing automatically by moving the, the sensor itself by sub pixels left, right, up yes. and down, um, it can quadruple the resolution of your images. And um, that I've actually found really useful in macro work because you can do pseudo macro work. Uh, I don't need, like if I use that mode with my camera, oh, you can just I get a crop one, in more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I get 187 megapixel image. I don't, I don't need that. Uh, yeah. The majority of my career, I used, you know, around 20 megapixels uh, yes. before I got a, a higher megapixel body. And, even, uh, and that didn't especially stop Especially for me. a book, you don't need more than that usually. Well, exactly. Uh, and, uh, or even making smaller prints or, or what have you. But the, the idea is that um, you can kind of thread the needle between, uh, you know, uh, cropping in to get that macro feel, right. but diffraction at a certain point. A point is always going to be that limiting factor and mm. so i found that you know you'd have to loosen up your apertures a little bit within that uh using that mode normally you might be shooting at say f11 yeah, try f8 uh or or a little bit wider than that in order to remove diffraction on those right. high resolution images but in doing so you would still have more depth of field and you can do so even without a macro lens uh and so yeah, yeah. In a way, I did some of the the shift stuff. The tilt, I I think it would be more applicable to video because you can focus stack to avoid that uh, in, it's in camera. True. And it's, it's true. It's so fine tuned to get that really narrow line of focus unless to you, play exactly where you want it to be. Unless you you shoot something macro that keeps moving, then it might be well, that and that's why video uh, or or something true. that uh, uh, you know is I mean. I've shot insects with focus stacking yeah. and that's worked. I mean, so, you know, there's always one way around it or another. Like if you were to shoot like the face of a watch or the mechanics on the back of an old mechanical oh, yeah, watch as they're spinning around and what have you, and you want to have that thin plane of focus on that over video, I think would be ideal. Right. Um, but those use cases are very few and far between. Maybe if I do a second edition of the book, I'll, I'll go <laughs> into there. I'm, it's I'm, already nearly 400 pages. I think that's enough for a single know, book. You know, the, the interesting interesting thing is you you do this deep dive um the the film photography book that monica and i did um we found out after we finished the first edition that we had forgotten about one important thing uh when you do large format photography the taco method which is when you have oh, a, yeah. a development Fold tank and, and you, the... you, you you bend you bend you don't fold them you bend them in a... oh, no, oh, yes 
and then and then you make them into taco shapes, those big, big negatives, and put them in a regular tank. And that's a good way to get started without too much. With a hairband, right? With a hairband or something. Very simple, very easy. And uh, we on all the workshops, everywhere we talked about the taco method. And then we forgot to put it into the first edition of our book. It just didn't happen. So, well, luckily there's a second one. Uh, well, and then speaking of um, analog photography, uh, I, I brought out uh, of my um, a glass display case yeah. a camera that you are familiar with. I was, I was um, wondering what that beauty of, a, of an object was <laughs> that you had right next to you. It says right here, Marquardt International Pin. Oh, no. And, uh, <laughs> and it has... It has a, a, a number one on the bottom. And yeah. people, uh, when I showed it to them, they asked, well, why, why, why does it say one? Oh, that's the serial number. Um. <laughs> yes, you were the first one to, to jump. And we, and we are extending this beyond the 10 that were originally made now. Um, very soon, there will be a way to order more because there is a bit more of that hardware and there are new cameras built and they are just in the process of being finished for... Um, for sale, I think it's about 50 that we have now. Uh, so 50 additional ones. After that, no more Marquardt International pinholes. There will be there, this is this is definitely going to be the end of that because well, because you you manufactured the the parts for the, uh, the well, we'll call it a lens. Um, the, and, the pinhole uh, holder and the and the tripod thread and the knobs on the side. Those those have been done. The, I had them done by a, a master craftsman. And they, that's pretty much all there are. That's, that, that's, it's expensive. You're not going to gonna do made. another run of those, right? <laughs> no, exactly. No, definitely not. But um, yeah, it's very soon. Internationalpinhole.com um, is the website. There's a form to get your name on a list. So um, I'll send out notifications as soon as everything is finished. But I can, I can one up you on that one. Oh, you've got that invisible camera. The invisible camera. camera. I just just a, a couple of weeks ago, I talked to Alan Adridge about the invisible camera because um, it was 1st of April recently, and that was the April Fool's joke we did 10 years ago. And uh, this is the original. <laughs> I, I know some just, people that have plexiglass bitter <laughs> feelings about this whole experiment, even still a, a decade in. Uh, and now that thing is covered in fingerprints. It, 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 yes, that was the biggest problem when shooting the video for the, the, the invisible camera was that A, it, it doesn't have this, the, the pinhole holder that I had, this was a skink pinhole holder from eBay, um, wasn't fixed in there, so it kept falling out. So I always had to tilt the camera back slightly so it wouldn't fall out. <laughs> it doesn't have a tripod thread, so we set it on top of a tripod that was flat on the top, so it was just sitting there by gravity and when shooting it kept falling off and then when you touch it of course it's a plexiglass box so it is full of fingerprints and we should we sh I, I i told uh, i talked about this with alan when we shot this one part of the video in the field where i pretend to go out and take photos with it in the forest it was a sunset shot so the sun was really low and beautiful light and there's this one iconic uh, shot where I hold the, up this plexiglass box and look at it longingly uh, in the sunlight. And after we shot that, all I could see was the fingerprints on it because the sun brought those out so well. But anyway, um, if anyone wants to listen more to that, a couple of episodes back, I talked about uh, uh, that with Alan. Anyway, that wasn't really what I have you here for. Um, both of us are, have kind of an interest in new camera developments and uh, new photographic things and technology in general. <clears throat> technology in general, and one of the companies that does technology and uh, has those regular, very well produced events is Apple. And uh, I, I'm in front of sitting in front of an iMac. I have an iPhone, uh, an Apple Watch, so I'm well vested in that universe and yeah i've got an, an iphone as well and uh, you know beautiful little device i i i switched to android briefly and then i just came back to apple because honestly um the longevity of service for a device from them uh is far greater than any other platform and that includes security fixes and i right. think we should all be a little bit more conscious of that type of thing so they've been bringing me back into yeah. the fold i still use so, a windows pc yeah. but 
a- Apple has me uh, to, to some level. So, so this is not an Apple ad, what we're doing here, but um, they just did one of their product announcement uh, shows. And uh, there is, I mean, a- Apple is the world's largest camera manufacturer. That's pretty much a given because every iPhone is a camera. Um, a few years ago, I read that they have like, well, back then they had like 600 people on the camera team. I mean, that's just mind boggling. Um, I mean, for, for, for that small area of, of the device, I mean, they're, they're working on screen technology, of course, the Wi-Fi and cellular technology and but the you, processors and everything yeah. else. But the camera has a team of many 600. hundreds, maybe even over a thousand now. At, at this point, probably more. And then, of course, the camera, I mean, it is the main reason for many people to buy a phone. The camera is one of the main reasons because they no one most uh, let's say regular people not as nerds but regular people will use their phone as their main camera that is their camera so um, the decision is often done by oh look they do more wide angle or they do more zoom or they do better night shot and so on so those features keep coming and coming computational photography is for has for years changed the game the the shallow depth of field the portrait mode the um the the fact that when you turn on the camera in the app even before you press the shutter it's all is already taken photos permanently and you and then they get stacked internally using some ai and they segment the photo into sky and face and ground and they treat those differently i mean this is there's an amazing amount of image processing going on. So so photography computational photography uh, yes. is is really where it's it's become uh, the greatest uh, growth area in the last at least 5 years. Absolutely. So so uh, looking at Apple when they released new things, of course I wanted to take a bit of a of a photography centric angle here. And uh, I think we can find one on most of the things that they announced there. So let's just go through the list. The new Macs, new iMacs are out. Um, photography wise, they, well, they, pho- they, they photograph well, cause they are now colorful. So that's one thing. Um, but the other thing is they now have new webcams in there. More resolution. I think this is really important because uh, Apple was lagging behind. It was also a very device. low bar, you know, 720p yeah. in a webcam is not really the thing you wanted to have. So, especially within the last year, with all of the uh, you know uh, online conferencing via whatever app you want to use, right. there's you know a, a dozen companies out there, but um, y- y- that is so much more important now. Uh, by orders of magnitude than it was a year and a half ago. Absolutely. Uh, and and I think that finally they've got up to 1080p, which I think is all the internet can really stand right it's, now. There's it's no all you need real right need now. to. Yes. There's only yeah. It, there's no reason to go to 4K, uh, even if you have the ability to uh, bandwidth limitations and such. Uh, I, I think that that jump has yet to come, uh, but they got there finally. Now. Nobody's going to be using the webcam on uh, an iMac to make art. Uh, you know, so it's it's not like a necessarily a photographic tool, but it is a communication tool. Yeah. Uh, and the better we are at communicating visually, the well, the better we are, I think. Very true. Um, they are also apparently packing more AI into this in the broadest sense. There's more image processing going on there. Um, I had I got a bit of a taste on the uh, MacBook Air with the M1 chip, which kind of does that. So there's more. There's more face brightening and stuff. Very inconspicuous. Beautification. A bit of yeah. beautification, but pretty inconspicuous. But if you now, if you sit in front of, uh, with, with a window in your back and you normally would be a silhouette, now it does some HDR-like processing on it. So uh, it works a bit better. Um, I would expect this, a similar thing to happen in those new iMacs. So yeah, that's a good development. Finally catching up, I think. I, and um, Apple's not one to play catch up. This is this is a really interesting development. This is one of the few areas I think that Apple needed to play it. They got there. This Congrats, was the most Apple. baffling. The 720p webcams in Apple's computers. That was the most baffling thing. The iMac Pro was the only one that had a 1080p camera so far. I'm not using that right now, but I could use it because um, it's it's decent. Yeah, and yep. yeah, catching up. Anyway, um, new iPad Pro. Which this is cool. Well, it is. It is. The, the mind-blowing thing for me is that they put an M1 chip in that. 
So that, well, that that's it because now, especially that their desktop platform is moving towards M1, and their mobile platform is as well. This is actually a huge asset, I think, for creatives, especially if you're using something like the uh, Adobe suite of software or any other big company that needs to be on like in the Apple ecosystem on a desktop platform or even their laptops, like just a, a regular right. computing device. Um, so that means that uh, a company doesn't have to create a separate version of their code base for a mobile platform. Yes, the, the UI is going to be different. I get that. But right. the underlying engine uh, behind the scenes doesn't have to be reinvented. And especially for legacy hardware or stuff that you build once and then you just continue to build on and on and on and on, right. it's less likely for any company to go all the way back to the drawing board and build it for one specific a different platform from the ground up. And Apple has, uh, you know, they, they've been, they're a big player here. They're, they're pushing this hard uh, by putting it into their desktops. And this their, is a uh, unification of the first. platform that's happening right it now, is, which yeah. is, I think it's pretty wild. Um, 12 megapixel camera. So they have a, a new front facing camera, a new uh, a selfie camera, but that is now um, Wider angle, a bit of an AI-based feature. The center stage feature is—is is that interesting? What do you think? I mean, it's not, what, not really. What, what but, they do I is mean, okay. What they do is a 100-degree uh, field of view, and then the, the, if you turn that on, it will just crop out your face and follow it, pretty much. So that's great for lazy people. I mean, uh, I can, <laughs> what are you going to do? Like be on a rocking chair, moving back and forth and have the camera follow you as you, uh, as you move around. Yeah. yeah I mean, sure. It, it'll work, but that, that, that's a, a gimmicky thing. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm I, not sure because, because it's a system wide setting. You can set it, um, for everything that uses the webcam, I believe. And what I've, what I, what I'm wondering about is if you look at a wide angle lens and you look, especially at the edge of that picture, you get oh, they're distorted. You get eggheads. You have you have yeah. weird distortions, especially in, on faces. That's very apparent. So I was wondering if that does the 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 follow you. Does it also de squeeze faces when you get closer to the edge? Is that part of if, it? Well, maybe not initially, but I think people will be clamoring for that if it's not part of the package right away. Because the uh, because what Apple also does, and they kind of secretly snuck it in, is uh, eye correction when you use FaceTime. They you might remember a while ago they did uh, they announced this feature that uh, that the problem is you you're looking at the screen and not at the camera, so the the other person sees you looking under the camera, and that is not right. very very relatable. So uh, Apple couple of years ago announced that feature to digitally correct the the gaze into the camera so it looks as if you were looking at the camera and uh, then it got a pretty big there was a pretty big uproar online about it and people are like oh this is creepy and we hate it and it's bad and so on but they have since just they just snuck it in without telling anyone pretty much without making any fuzz about it so nowadays you you have that you can turn it off but it's on by default it's quite subtle but there is a difference if it's on or off. So that, that's interesting. I, I remember the uproar about it. I didn't know it came back secretly and silently. It's in there. I don't do a it's lot of FaceTiming, but yeah. It's in there. <laughs> and it's and it's on my default and no one really noticed it coming back. I don't even know when it came back. So camera wise, um display wise, the what they call liquid retina display. I think it's interesting that the the P3 color space, the pretty wide color space is now pretty much standard on yeah p3 i think was an apps, apple right? invention right they pioneered that uh at least over a decade ago i mean it's been around for a while uh right. and it's got a color gamut i think is something around 25 percent more than srgb so possibly not the widest and the best but definitely better than the bare basic minimum that we had been dealing with in the past right. and do, do they say if it's a hundred percent coverage or a lot of Companies are like 99% P3 or if, it's, I uh, didn't if it check. gets there all the way. I didn't check. It says in the, in the tech uh, specs of the new iPad Pro, it says P3 color space. So I would assume that that means it covers it. I have always been a little bit shy about using uh, a mobile device in um, an uncontrolled environment to do critical work, <laughs> right? Like, this is because. True. 
because you've got like you might be viewing it at different angles or the lighting around you, the color temperatures, the light reflecting off of the surface. They're all glossy devices now. Right. right? And, um, and especially when Apple has technology that changes the color temperature of, of the display based on the amount or the type quality of ambient light that's around you. Um, and so that makes it difficult no matter how good the display is. Um, if like, I mean, I don't mind it on my iPhone because I'm not using that as a content creation device. Uh, but if I was, I'd want to make sure all of those features are, are turned off in order to maintain the, um, I, I guess, the integrity of, of the color that I should be seeing, right? I think, I think um, it's... Well, w w the way I work when I when I travel, which I haven't done in quite a while, but if I do, is that I work on my photos on a laptop, and that um, doesn't have that full color space, or at least didn't have it until just recently. So I would work in this uncontrolled environment, in this I don't know hotel room, hotel lobby, or somewhere. Uh, work on those photos as far as I could with the experience I have, um, keeping an eye on the histogram and just going as far as it feels okay and then just cross-check them back home. And um, and uh, it, it, over the last few years, and it, I don't know if, if the displays have become better, if that adaption to local light conditions, to the color is helpful, but um, the one thing I noticed is but I didn't need to fix things that much anymore back home as I used to. Well, and it also helps. I mean, the display technology has been improving. Even um, on a mobile platform, it used to be there, there was a big divide between having a, uh, a solid uh, placed, you know, 20 to 30 inch monitor um, that was decidedly thicker uh, by the design yeah. and, and so on. Uh, and, and you could just get better uh, accuracy from that where the thinner displays the viewing of off, off axis was just so bad uh and uh you know it just the, the color accuracy the contrast the dynamic range wasn't there it's gotten a lot better and then that divide has been been closed up but i think it's closed up even better if you uh, if you're able to color calibrate your displays uh and i do that on my on my laptop on my uh you know i've got a beautiful uh asus Pro art uh, display that I usually do my editing and stuff on here in my office. Um, but Apple had another announcement, I think, using your iPhone as a bridge <laughs> to, to kind of uh, allow you to create this uh, slightly more color accurate environment via Apple TV, right? Well, it's especially for the Apple TV, right, where um, you would always have these different panels from different manufacturers in the TVs. And of course, uh, the 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 television nerds, the home uh, cinema nerds would um, would get some Spider Pro or something else to ca calibrate their displays properly so that you would see what the what the t what the TV box is sending you. And that was a bit of a daunting process. And uh, Apple now apparently replaced that by using, you can now use your iPhone to profile that display with an Apple TV connected. Um, interesting. I'm not sure how good it is. I mean, I've seen this in the presentation and they have, I guess, ho hopefully an abbreviated version where they show like four different colors and f four different grayscales. Uh, and that's it. Um, I would expect a bit more this to be a bit more involved when you actually do it, hopefully, because yeah, I've been working uh, with well, targets. I mean, usually, there's at least yeah. uh, you know forty five to fifty different colors. Sometimes exactly. it's more, and they they have to they, they can go by quickly. Um, but yeah. um, keep in mind too that if you're using a phone as a calibration device, it's using its cameras, and thereby it would be a colorimeter, which measures right. um, the uh, the end color that's detected, and not a photospectrometer that's measuring the individual wavelengths. And right. On certain which, TV which, display which technologies, is how most that, of these, that makes a difference. Yeah, which which is how most of these cheaper devices work anyway. They don't yeah. uh, really do spect, uh, spectrum spectrometry, but it, yeah, it might probably be better than nothing. Um, the one thing I just recently heard, and I'm I'm not in deep in that TV area, so uh, the one thing I heard is that uh, same with computers, um, the TV panels have become quite a bit better over the last ten years. So a lot of the higher end TVs at least don't really require any calibration because they already come with uh, 
a very good color from from the factory same as with an iMac I mean this is one of the things I learned when I switched to to uh to the iMac is that the panels in there are so well profiled calibrated from the factory that I hardly have to do anything with them yeah I, I mean I, I do I calibrate on a regular basis when I know I'm gonna be you know churning through a body of work True. Um, especially with uh, specific colors in mind uh, that I want to make sure are as accurate as possible especially if the final result you know going all the way down the, the pipeline to printing um, and then I'll calibrate that as well so there's no uh, you know unwanted surprises and guesswork and reprinting and doing some little patches of prints with different modifications to find one that actually works properly it's so much easier to just have it all calibrated uh, and to have that work and the thing is uh, as as you kind of mentioned some people will use a spider and x uh you know i'm sure there's other companies as well uh, i know some displays like uh, ESO has calibration built right into them they've got True. this little thing that swings up and i don't know who makes that but uh the, the thing is that's specialized and that's professional. Um, if you want to bring this color accuracy to people that they probably spend more on their phone than they do on most other devices, right? <laughs> Especially their true. TVs, right? So you might spend a thousand dollars on your phone, but you see a deal for a TV for 150 bucks. Well, you buy that TV, the image quality is not going to be great, uh, you know, at least right out of the box, because one of the things that you pay for when you pay a higher price tag is not only the components, but the quality assurance that goes along with that. Right. Um, and so this kind of brings it to the masses in a way that kind of makes the, um, the process of calibrating a display more uh, just uh, commonsensical to everybody. Like, you know, it, this is something that you can do and you should do. Whereas previously, if Apple wasn't allowing you to do this, most people would be completely ignorant to the fact that it could even be done. So last product that they announced, at least <laughs> on my list here. Um, and I'm not sure, I, well, let's just try to find a photography angle there. The air tags, the little button size devices that will allow you to find stuff how often do you misplace a camera uh well i mean my main camera is not that often but you know if i uh and 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 th this beauty that i have here i always know where, where this uh <laughs> pinhole camera is it's kind of hard to misplace something that large uh but you know i i do misplace uh particularly pieces of equipment, you know, gear, lenses, et cetera. I'm not necessarily going to attach a an air tag to every lens when I'm looking for something that would specific. That would get pretty expensive. That would be, and it would look awkward to see these things arbitrarily strapped to various bits and pieces of lenses You and can integrate and them in the lens cap, but then the only thing you can find is your lens cap, probably. Yeah, I, <laughs> I lose my lens caps all the time. Uh, so I, I think that uh, photographically, for me, one of the big things that's... Uh, stood out uh, on, on this format was the the ability to integrate um, uh, sort of uh, augmented reality within this. So mm. you can have a, a camera that can detect a and the exact location in, in 3D space where one of these air tags are, and that air tag can project something on the camera um, that you won't see in reality. And I think that's really cool. But, I but, think that's, that can, but that's not there just yet. That is just uh, one of the it's possibilities, not, it's not right? Yet, but I'm, I'm imagining these possibilities because, uh, you know, that, that, that's what I want to do. I, I uh, and, mean, and I could think that... The, the technology, the ultra-wideband technology that's kind, that's kind of behind this, which is going to let you or does let you pinpoint things with, I don't know what precision, centimeter precision, something like that. So... Uh, fairly precise as opposed to uh, just what, what Bluetooth will give you. Um, that is That has a lot of promise. And there's a good reason why since the, was it iPhone 11, Apple has put ultra-wideband chips into all their iPhones and other devices. Um, so I would expect that ultra-wideband thing to become an important player over time. I, really I think, think so. Uh, but I also think that, you know, we... We all have expensive equipment, whether it's camera gear or anything else. I mean, I might want to stick one of these somewhere um, in a clandestine location in my car, in my daughter's backpack, you know, in may maybe in my camera bag. Uh, so if my if my equipment gets stolen, then I might be able to at least track it down or inform but, the authorities where it was last seen. Um, but you, but who you knows? Can, might... 
But you can't really, I mean, one of the features they put in there is that you can't really just slip that into someone's pocket and then tra track them because um, that would, that, 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 that thing will then either tell them on their iPhone, if they have one, that they are being accompanied by uh, an AirTag, or um, if you don't have an iPhone, it, it'll start beeping soon after that. So yeah, uh, so maybe that won't work. That I'm won't just trying really to think work. of ideas here <laughs> that that might uh, that might play into this. Maybe um, maybe it becomes an open standard, and sooner or later, all devices, all cameras, all everything will have that cool. technology automatically built in by default. Simple, cheap chip that you can put in there, and then it it's it's. And if it's an internalized yeah. device, it would have different protocols. It wouldn't start beeping when an iPhone isn't around or, or what have you. It would uh, be able to, you know, to say, okay, well, uh, you turned on this feature on your camera. It was last seen uh, landing at an airport in Bangladesh. It's kind of, um, it's, it's kind, it's kind, it kind of does have a dystopian angle, though. So, uh, yeah. anyway, I don't know. I mean, I don't like being tracked, although I. Also, on well, the other but you side have of that a, coin, but you have an iPhone, so you have a smartphone. I like keeping track of things, and and I have a smartphone. I mean, I'm no matter how hard I try not to be tracked, I'm using a modern operating system on my computer. I have a modern smartphone. Uh, you know, I'm being tracked, no matter how many toggles I flip off. Um, so, so maybe maybe, uh, maybe that ship has sailed. Maybe there's something to be said about old cameras that don't have any wireless connectivity built in. Maybe, uh, you know. Uh, in fact, I, I one, recently this turned one, on this, this transparent one. You could even see if something's <laughs> built in there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I recently turned on Bluetooth on my uh, uh, Lumix full frame cameras because um, one of the things I was missing when I was previously shooting Canon is that they would have a uh, built in or an add on GPS unit, and I loved having my images mm. being able to be geotagged. As a result of that, uh, it's just very easy to sort things if you're traveling and uh, and what have you. Um, and I realized that through the Lumix app on my phone, if I turn Bluetooth on and I sync them up, it'll use the GPS location of my phone and tag the camera, uh, the, the raw files with that data, which kind of gives me that same uh, convenience of, of having the GPS information embedded. But now I've gone... I've gone down the rabbit hole here. Not only do I have a connected smartphone um, that could be spying on me, I've also connected it to my camera to extend its reach. Uh, and that technology and that convenience of this technology, I think, is going to become so dominant in our lives that it's just, you know, how many times, Chris, have you like clicked on an end user license agreement and just, yeah, I agree. Of I mean, course, all the pretty time. well every time. Like you don't know, you don't know what's in there, what you're giving up, what you're compromising within that process. Um, and I think that as technology continues to evolve and continues to invade our privacy on, on many different ways, that that's that's only going to continue. Um, and uh, even like you can go into the most remote parts of the world right now, uh, and you could have you know a, a Starlink connection to the internet anywhere on the planet. Uh, well, maybe not anywhere right now, but in the future, and be completely connected to everything you need to be. And also, not just your connection outward, but a, a connection inward. So, um, But as photographers, I, I don't know, should we embrace this connectivity or should we shy away from it and, and use invisible cameras? <laughs> That's a very good question. If, if I'm, uh, I, I remember many times where I was completely offline somewhere in the jungle that doesn't have connectivity and that was cool that was fine i that was serene I, 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 I just want to interject briefly uh chris i was in the yukon wilderness twice for two or three weeks at a time and it actually took a couple of days for me to get through connectivity withdrawal yeah. uh and then for a period of however long it was my mind didn't go off into okay, what what's happening on Twitter, or right. you know, do I have any new emails, or did somebody respond to this one thing, or no? I just it's all these, I was in the moment. All these tiny little squirts of dopamine, right? Um, yeah. There's and okay, so so being completely offline, wonderful. Being completely online, wonderful. And then there's this in between area where you have just barely enough connectivity to send out a tweet or check something. That is kill. That kills me. It's anxiety. <laughs> no, no, I can't handle that. So I'm either online or offline, but nothing in between. Um, speaking of Apple, we have um, just not that it's really. Not that really helpful to track patents, but uh, Apple has just recently been granted 96 patents around 
inventions like Face ID and had head-mounted display things. So oh, I love this one. The, this VR headset with corrective lens system, that's my favorite of the bunch. Yeah, so so I'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. I don't want to go really deep into that. but um, I, I do want to make one comment about that one, though. Of course. Apple has had shown no interest in doing anything relating to VR. Um, AR, yes, but not like VR headsets and, and that whole virtual reality environment. Um, the fact that they are putting in some fairly specific patents within into the space uh, it's not indicative of any product that's coming out, but it does show their interest in that area. And I find that interesting because the, it means that Apple is doing research into this space quite oh, actively. Definitely. The, the rumor mill has it that there will be uh, AR and VR from Apple. So we'll figure that out pretty soon. I think, uh, I think AirTags will play a role in that as well. Just Totally. Because you can, you can find them. Anyway, um, last but not least... It is, we're recording this on Saturday, the 24th of April, which happens to be World Pinhole Day. And uh, ah, we alluded to that in the beginning. <laughs> yes, we did. Which, uh, which does have the most uh, web 1.0 type web page, um, which again, uh, this is no, a it one doesn't have an animate, it doesn't have an animated uh, mailbox. That's, it doesn't have a repeating <laughs> pattern, uh, uh, very small tiled JPEG in the background either. Uh -huh. So Marquee they, they tag can, is they missing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, the world spin all day is, a uh, is, um, I think volunteer driven celebration, annual celebration of pinhole photography. Um, and it's once a year, um, right today so it's a bit too late as an announcement for everyone out there but um it is going to yield photos taken with pinhole cameras and that could be film-based pinhole cameras that could be digital pinhole cameras there's you can buy a lens cap that has a pinhole yes. in it and then on here it navigates a bit let's let me find the gallery there's like an exhibition up there so you get pinhole photos and then you get get to see all the different pinhole pictures that people have submitted this one is from last year uh but of course there will be photos from this year um color black and white interesting stuff um mundane stuff everything in there pretty much and i like that because but one of my favorite weekend projects like a sunday afternoon project is to build a pinhole camera from a matchbox because the, the the typical size matchboxes are just wide enough to pull through uh, a, a stripe of 35 millimeter film. So what you would do is you would take that, that, that matchbox, you would take that drawer out, empty it, cut a rectangular hole in the back of that drawer, uh, which then your film goes between the back of the drawer and the, and, uh, the, the outside of the matchbox. And then all you have to do is put a hole in the front, put a piece of aluminum foil on it and pin a hole in there, make it light tight, and then you end up with a camera that can shoot multiple very tiny pinhole photos. Not very sharp, I, you know, but fun. I haven't made one of those yet. Um, I've always wanted to, and they're not very sharp, and it's it's just kind of a fun project that you're, you're not going to make a masterpiece with it. But no. the fact <laughs> that you can do it. and uh, but But one thing that you can do uh, with a pinhole camera that you, you can't really do in any other way. And it's something that I have been wanting to do. In fact, as we're coming up uh, to, uh, well, we're, we're, we're kind of in the middle of solstices, but when we get to the summer one, uh, I want to set up a, uh, a pinhole can uh, to make a uh, solarography type camera yes. where I put a piece of uh, photosensitive paper in place of film uh, and put a tiny pinhole in the front of the can. And because the, the back of the can obviously is curved, um, then it becomes a very wide angle effect. And uh, I'm gonna sit that out there for six months. Yes. Uh, from the, the highest point of the sun in the sky to the lowest point, and I can make an exposure, and anybody can. Uh, you know, there's tutorials online to do this. I just, I've always missed that moment, and I just, ah, well, I'll catch the next one. And then six months go by, ah, I'll, I'll catch the next one. And it's so easy um, to do, because all you need is a soda can and, uh, and a piece of photo paper and a bit of black duct tape to close it off and that's it pretty much 
Yeah, I'll just tape one to the chimney of my house or something, yeah. you know, something at a slightly higher vantage point uh, so that you can really see the sun uh, tracking around. And you can make a six month exposure that I don't think there's any other uh, feasible way to do it. I was actually thinking of doing it with my Mark Ward International Pinhole, putting it in one of, we've got some bay windows in the backyard. Leave that out in the elements for six months? And, <laughs> no, 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 uh, not, not out in the elements, inside the house, but right oh, up I against see. a window. I see. And then put and try to calculate exactly how much of a neutral density filter I would require on the front versus film reciprocity failure over that period of time. And I just looked at all the math and I'm thinking... I would just no, wing it. I'm I would just put <laughs> put a piece of film in there and, uh, and uh, not a piece of film, a piece of paper in there photo paper and have it exposed and the and the interesting thing is how you how you get the photo into your into the digital realm is you take it out in the dark you put it on the scanner in the dark and you scan it because the photo and you have to make sure that your scanner is set to a lower resolution so it doesn't scan partway through and then stop and yes. then scan a little bit more and stop. Yes, it has because to be in one go. it's actively exposing it and destroying it in the process. So but, make sure you've tested your scanner beforehand. But the cool thing is, and that's one thing I learned from that, is that the film, the photo on the film is in fact visible. It doesn't need to be developed. It is there. Um, you can see it with your bare eyes. Unfortunately, by seeing it with your eyes, you're exposing it to light and it goes away. So it's not visible that long. But if you, if you want to try that, just take a piece of just black and white film that is unexposed take it out cheap a cheap one rip it out and then put something on it just something like a shape a piece of cardboard uh, put a something opaque on it and expose it and then after five minutes take that thing off and you'll see the shape on the film for a brief time so it is possible to do that so fun projects absolutely don thank you so much for joining tips from the top floor um your website is this one doncom.ca that has that's right like all your projects uh your your photos your macro photography of course uh, the snowflakes your infrared work um a lot of these photos are um definitely going to be in the book so and how you make them too. It's not a photo book, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. must say that it, it's uh, it's entirely instructional. Um, but uh, you know, I, and I was just making another one of these images in this water droplet, uh, you know, uh, category the other day, and I haven't had a chance to to edit it yet. Um, but I am so eager to like as soon as this call ends, as soon as this interview is over here, I'm going to get right back into Lightroom and uh, <laughs> continue to tinker and, and make some magic because you know what. Um, there is so much photographic joy that you can find right at home. And the one that I'm working on is actually a, a derivation of, of one that I'd done years ago, I think uh, nine years ago or 10 years ago, um, where I had, uh, I had worked on an image that had the earth in a water droplet. And uh, as we're recording this yesterday was Earth Day, so it gave me yeah. the idea to I try to recreate this. Um, and I, I've got this image that I'm working on with the earth in a water drop that's just barely dangling off the edge of a flower petal about to drop. Uh, you know, the, the fragile planet that we have right now. Um, and you can just do that in your own in your own home. NASA has these, uh, you know, maps of the earth as public domain uh, archives. And you, you can print that out, put it behind it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's all you have to do. Wonderful. Um, if anyone wants to get their hand on your new book that is about to drop right now, the, the macro photography book, how would they find that? They would find that at skycrystals.ca, which is confusing because that's not the name of the book, but it was the name of my first book. Uh, and so I'm piggybacking off of the e-commerce system for that right now until I get the full launch underway. Uh, and ah, you can get... Uh, I can see it. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, and that the pre-order moniker will disappear very shortly. In fact, if you order the ebook version, uh, I should actually remove the pre-order uh, list from that right now because it is out. Uh, you'd get it immediately. But if, if, uh, I, if it, I release this episode today on the 24th, people can just go there and order it. Yep, absolutely. In Perfect. fact, as soon as this call ends, I will activate a coupon code for anybody listening to this <gasps> podcast. And uh, I mean, it's not going to be a whole lot, uh, but let's say $5 off of either That's the physical cool. edition or the ebook edition. Uh, and let's just make that code uh, TFTTF. TFTTF. I'll put that in the show notes. Thanks so much, Don. Um, good luck with the book and I hope to see you soon again. 
Thank you very much, Chris. Always a pleasure. Take care.